Welcome to Functional Philosophy, the show in which I, Charles II, explain and apply Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. If you'd like to ask me a question on Objectivism or its application, just go to charles2.com slash contact. And my last name is spelled T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. In a recent episode of your podcast, you indicated that harassing phone calls are physical force because there are actual particles used to carry the harassing information. This doesn't make any sense to me. Could you elaborate on what non-physical force is, since all information must reach another person by physical means? It seems somewhat rationalistic to call harassment over a phone physical just because it involves physical entities, as anything between two people would have to do. Well, you have missed my point entirely. I was not saying that harassment is physical force because it involves a physical means of transmitting information. I was saying that you can't rule out harassment as a form of physical force on the grounds that it isn't physical because it is physical. Some people think of things like harassment as ethereal, and my point was merely that by physically clogging up someone's lines of communication with unwanted messages, you are violating his rights when you know he doesn't want those messages. I disagree completely regarding responsibility for a conceived child. If you cause a child to be brought into the world, then you are responsible for it. This is in response to my answer to a question on whether a man is responsible for a child, even if he didn't want the woman to have it, I think. Or maybe I just went off on a tangent one time and talked about this. In any case, my view is that no, a man is not responsible for a child if he made clear that he did not want a child and the woman had the child anyway. This is a substitute question, by the way. Well, it's not really a question, it's a comment. So someone who causes a child to be brought into the world is responsible for it. And the man caused the child to be brought into the world by impregnating the woman. Well, what about his father? Did his father cause the child to be brought into the world? Because that child wouldn't have been brought into the world if the man who impregnated the woman had not been born. So really the man's father also bears responsibility for the child, as does his whole lineage throughout all history. You can take this chain of causality back forever, and eventually you'll have to say the whole universe is responsible for this child. Now you will say, but none of those people or things are directly responsible. The man directly impregnated the woman, so that's the line. But it isn't the line. The line is, who had final say? Now, a director is responsible for the movie he produces, for the performances of his actors, for instance. Now, you might say, but the actors are the ones doing the acting. Yes, but the director gets to choose whether to accept the first performance they provide him, or the second, or the third, or whichever. He can say, no, that's not what I wanted, and give them direction until he gets what he wants. So the director is rightly held responsible for how the movie turns out, including the quality of the performances in it. Now, in the same way, since a woman has control over whether she has an abortion or gives birth, she is responsible for the child if it is born. Whoever has final say is responsible. A man cannot and should not be able to force a woman to get an abortion if he doesn't want a child, nor should he be able to force her to carry the pregnancy all the way to birth if she doesn't want a child. 
But because of that, if she wants a child and the man doesn't, she now bears sole responsibility for the child because she is the one making the choice. Now, a man can't change his mind. He can't say, yeah, I want to have a kid. And then after the kid is born, say, no, never mind. And then leave. Then he would be on the hook. But if after conception, when the couple finds out that she is pregnant and he makes clear that he doesn't want to have a kid, if she goes through with it, that kid is her responsibility and hers alone. And so if you say the man is responsible in that case, then you really are going by the logic that would make the entire universe responsible for the kid. Because the difference between the man and his father and the person who sold him a hamburger at McDonald's that kept him alive so that he could have sex and impregnate the woman, those people are all responsible in the same way he is. Yes, he's closer to the final outcome, but it's only a difference of degree. The real difference is that the woman has final say, which she should have, but then she has to take responsibility. Imagine somebody bumps into you and you trip and fall over. And as you are heading toward the ground, you decide, you know what? I'm not going to put my arms out. I easily could. I could easily prevent my face from smashing into the pavement, but I'm not going to. And so you just let yourself fall to the ground and you break your face and lose some teeth, then what? Is the person who bumped into you responsible? No, because you chose to let yourself fall face first into the pavement. If we're playing catch and I throw you the ball and then you just decide not to catch it, you just let the ball hurtle towards you and hit you in the face. Uh, is that my fault now? I caused it, right? No. You could have caught it. You could have easily moved out of the way. It is your fault, your responsibility. So that's the principle. Who has responsibility? The person who was in control. The person who made the final decision. Not everyone involved in the causal chain going back forever that eventually led to the outcome you approved of. Could you please define evasion... And is it possible for someone to be religious through honest errors or only as a result of evasion? Evasion is the crowding out from focal awareness of that material which is most relevant to your values at any given moment. Now, evasion is different from drifting or merely not thinking. Drifting is passively ignoring reality. Evasion is actively doing so. So think about a guard in a tower at a military fort and he has a spotlight. He's shining around at night watching for intruders. Now that spotlight is your focal awareness. It's what's in your conscious mind. Now being in focus means directing that spotlight toward what you should be paying attention to. So if you hear a noise over near some bushes, you should direct that spotlight over to those bushes and pay attention to them and see if somebody's trying to sneak into the fort by hiding in those bushes. That's being in focus. Now, being in focus means focusing on what you should be focusing on. It doesn't just mean being conscious. So long as you're not asleep or knocked out, something is in focus. That spotlight is shining on something. But being in focus, to use Ayn Rand's term, means shining that spotlight on what it should be shown on. Now, evasion is the act of moving that spotlight away from the bushes because you're afraid that there is somebody in the bushes and that an attack is imminent and this is an enemy agent performing recon. So you shine the spotlight somewhere else so that you won't see if it's an agent, so that you won't have to be afraid because you won't focus on that, you won't think about it, you won't know. That's evasion. It is actively moving the spotlight away from what you know you should be looking at. Drifting, on the other hand, is just taking your hands off the spotlight completely. Now, as I said, if you're awake, 
If the light is on, it's shining on something. But drifting is just letting it shine on whatever happens to mosey on past the light wherever it happens to be shining. So that's when you're just sitting there and you're not thinking and you're not taking control and things just enter your consciousness and random stimuli strike you and you have random thoughts and you're not taking control of shining that spotlight. And then, of course, being asleep is the equivalent of turning the spotlight off. And then it's not shining on anything. You do have some form of awareness when you're sleeping, but it's not the same as when you're awake. Probably a more accurate analogy would be that going to sleep is like... It's a form of just leaving the spotlight pointed in a certain direction, like drifting, because that's what you're doing when you're sleeping, unless you're lucid dreaming. It's just your subconscious is sending you things. So anyway, that's what evasion is. It is the active ignoring of reality. It is positively directing your attention towards something other than what you should be paying attention to. This is why I use the term crowding out. Because, as I said, you're always focused on something. So evasion really comes down to crowding out focus on what's most relevant to your values at any given moment with something else. And that something else is going to be your desires, or fears, your emotions. This is why I say that emotionalism and evasion are the same thing. The two terms just emphasize different aspects of what is in reality one process. So let's go back to the tried and true diet and cake example. You see this piece of cake, you want to eat it. You know you shouldn't, because if you stick to your diet, you will be healthier and happier. But the cake would taste good. Now, being in focus means paying attention to the fact that not eating the cake is what is in your self-interest. Evasion is pushing that knowledge out of your mind by focusing on the pleasure you anticipate experiencing by eating the cake. So again, there's something in your conscious mind. Evasion comprises pushing out what you should be focusing on and instead focusing on what you shouldn't be focusing on, which will always be some emotion unsanctioned by reason. That's all there is to focus on, besides reality. Now, I'm not saying that making the right decision doesn't involve emotion. It does, but you generate that emotion by thinking about what you should be thinking about. And evasion involves just going with an uncriticized emotion. You have to be motivated one way or the other. That's what emotions do. But when you evade, what you do is you focus on an emotion that implies an action you can't rationally justify, rather than on a rational justification or an emotion after you have rationally justified it. So that's evasion. Now, is it possible to be religious through honest errors or only through evasion? I do not believe it is possible to be religious and completely honest. Now, that is not the same as saying that if you are not an atheist, you are dishonest. Being an atheist or being religious are not the only alternatives. You could also simply not have thought about the subject at all, or not have come to a conclusion. So don't get this confused. I'm not saying it's dishonest to not be an atheist, but I do think it requires some degree of dishonesty to be positively religious. Having no view on religion or atheism isn't necessarily dishonest, I don't think, and even if it is, it could be the result of drifting rather than evasion, of simply not thinking about the issue when you know you should, rather than actively directing your attention towards something else. Now, I don't think you have to be a monster in order to be religious. I think most people who claim to be believers are just cowards. There are very few people who, I think, really believe positively in 
supernaturalism or God. You can't make yourself believe something. What you can do is think and act as if something were true, even if you know it doesn't really make sense. And I think that's what most religious people do out of fear of accepting that reality is cold and hard and factual, and that there is no being who will suspend the law of identity for them. Most people who profess to believe in God either know that supernaturalism contradicts something else they know, or at the very least, they know that they don't have an ironclad case for the existence of God. Maybe you can get to a point where you have confused yourself enough to think that God might really exist, but that process would involve some serious evasion. Anyway, I don't say anybody who believes in God or who is religious is a monster. You can do immoral things and then come back from them, assuming they're not too immoral. But I do think that anyone who is positively religious has been dishonest somewhere to some degree. Which is why I don't advocate trying to persuade them of atheism or, really, anything else. There's a phrase that goes, you can't reason someone out of a position he didn't reason himself into. Sam Harris likes to criticize this on the grounds that there are many religious people who come out of religion become atheists when they read Harris or Dawkins or whoever. Now, this does in fact occur, but Sam Harris's view of what's going on here is wrong. Now, the phrase is not precise, although the spirit of it is true. To be technically accurate, you would say that you can't reason someone out of a position so long as he is not open to reason. Now, what happens is that people are irrational, they accept religion, and then some small number of them later irreducibly choose to be rational. And at that point, they are open to reason and may be persuaded to become atheists. But the point is that they have brought something to the table. Maybe they need to hear somebody like Sam Harris in order to be persuaded to become atheists, but Sam Harris can sit there all day long, and until that person chooses to be rational, he will not be persuaded. At least not rationally. So it is possible, if you cast a wide enough net, and you spend a lot of time trying to persuade religious people, that you will occasionally be in the right place at the right time and give someone the right argument after he has chosen to be rational, but before he has yet abdicated his religious worldview. That is an irrational strategy, though. Far better to focus on people who have a track record of being rational than to focus on people who have a track record of being irrational and hope that you catch one of them as he's choosing to be rational. Again, it's not impossible, but if you're going to spend your time trying to persuade people, it's not a good idea to spend your time with people who you have no reason to think are currently being rational based on their past actions. If you'd like to keep up with everything I do, just go to charles2.com. If you'd like to enable me to do more, just go to patreon.com slash charles2 and become a supporter. Thanks for listening.